Today we're going to talk about the double chin and neck rejuvenation. People come to me asking for improvements in the neck area and I wanted to share with you guys the reasons for neck fullness as well as non-surgical and surgical approaches to improve that area. We will also be covering the cost of some of these more common procedures at the end of the talk, so stay tuned. Let's talk about the layers and the components of the neck because when you're treating the neck, you need to understand the anatomy and what exactly you're treating, which layer, which component. So first you have the skin, obviously, right? We all know there's skin overlying this area and sometimes the skin can get lax and it can create some degree of fullness and a degree of redundancy as well. Then you have the subcutaneous fat. This is a layer of fat that's right underneath the skin and that fat can be targeted for improvement as well. Then you have the platysma muscle. That's the muscle that's right just deep to that initial fat layer and it's the muscle that's actually part of the SMAS layer which is the superficial musculoaponeurotic system which I talk about in our facelifting video and that platysma muscle is an extension of the SMAS that's in the face. Then you have the subplatysmal fat. This is fat that exists deep to the platysma muscle and then we have the digastric muscles. And in the center here, there's the anterior belly of the digastric muscle that we're gonna flash here. And sometimes there's fullness in that muscle that can give you some degree of, of heaviness in the neck. And of course, we have the submandibular glands. These are glands that produce saliva that live just under here. And they can also get bigger and they can get more lax and totic as we age. And that can also give the appearance of a heavier neck. Now each one of those components and layers can add bulk and it can cause some degree of irregularity as well when you look at somebody's neck. And the main goal is to recreate a more acute cervical mental angle, right? So cervical is this vertical component and mental is this horizontal component and recreating that more acute angle is what most people desire. And we're gonna include here the Dito classification of that angle and the neck appearance here. Now let's talk about the clinical examination because it's very important to do a good examination to determine which of these components in the neck is primarily responsible for the fullness that we see so we can properly address it. The first is the degree of skin laxity. That's like how much redundancy there is in the neck skin. Sometimes the jowls are also full and other times it's just some, some extra skin in the neck area but usually it's a consolation of extra skin that's kind of sagging over time that some people have. Then you have the degree of that deep fat that's deep to the platysma muscle and the degree of fat that's superficial to the platysma muscle. So sometimes you can have people kind of clench their neck like this so you can actually see the muscle and then you can take a feel and feel how much of that fat is above the muscle versus deep to the muscle. Then there's platysmal banding. You probably have seen on some patients where there's like vertical lines and that's from the actual edge of the platysma muscle or ridges in the muscle that can give off the impression of this type of banding and that's important to figure out. Then you have submandibular gland hypertrophy and ptosis and that's going to be further lateral out here on the sides. It's going to give the impression of a heaviness and almost like a little bit of like a scoop type of fullness here and that's the submandibular glands that might be involved. Then there's the hyoid location. The hyoid is a bone. It lives all the way up in here and the hyoid bone can be positioned in somebody higher up or lower down and it can be further forward or further back. The most like ideal location as far as neck anatomy would be a high position of that bone and further back. That's going to allow for a more acute angle. In some people it's positioned fo forward and down and you can never really achieve a super acute angle to the neck because of that hyoid position. And lastly, we have the degree of chin projection. If the chin is forward and projected, the neck is going to be able to kind of nicely hang over that projected chin as opposed to a chin that's recessed back where there isn't that definition to the neck because the chin is far back. So the more forward we can bring the chin, usually the more acute we can get the neck angle. The first element that we're gonna jump into here is excess skin. So too much skin in the neck. What are some non-surgical options for that? Well, the first is PDO threads. 
thread lifting, as you guys may have heard of. That is something temporary. Results can last up to maybe a year, but what happens is as you lift the area with threads that are usually secured out laterally here or behind the ear, there's skin bunching that develops. So the skin is not removed, the skin is just repositioned and oftentimes bunches up. And as that bunching improves, usually you lose the impact of that lift. So the results often are not what people expect, especially over the course of weeks and months with thread lifting. Also, you could get irregularities to the skin because of the way that the threads pull. Sometimes there's dimpling that can occur. Sometimes it just looks a bit unnatural because if it, the thread is placed too superficially and not deep enough, you can actually see the thread and sometimes those bars of the thread running through just underneath the skin. Another option for non-surgical skin improvement of the neck would be filler. Some people use filler into the deeper folds of the neck to try to reduce that irregularity and smooth out the neck. Now that's again a temporary type of option but can somewhat help in the right candidate. Also there are radio frequency with and without microneedling devices and that is used to sometimes tighten the neck area, the neck skin, and sometimes it can actually cook some of the fat underneath the skin and give some improvement in that area as well. But that is another option for sometimes addressing at least mild forms of excess skin that occur in the neck or submental double chin area. Now let's talk about excess skin and surgical options to address that issue. There is of course the facelift neck lift combination. Usually when we're doing a facelift, we're doing a lower face and neck lift together. That's what the name actually implies. And when we're doing this type of treatment for excess skin in the neck, we will need a lateral approach, meaning the incisions generally go around the ear to address the extra skin in the system. And we can remove that skin out laterally and suture everything up so it really doesn't look like much was done. And that is a surgical approach to addressing excess skin. Also, there is a direct neck excision approach, direct neck lift with a Z-plasty and what we call a Grecian urn type of shape that we remove in patients who don't want that uh, excision around the ears and having scars there. If they prefer to have the scars be down the middle here, you could do a direct neck lift, but the scars can be fairly visible in the neck region. So those are the skin types of treatments that we can do surgical and non-surgical to address the double chin. Please make sure to subscribe to our channel. Hit that like button and turn on notifications so that you guys know when we're putting out more videos. Now let's talk about excess subcutaneous fat and the non-surgical modalities that exist to treat it. The first is kybella, which is deoxycholic acid. This is a way to chemically break down fat. Deoxycholic acid is a naturally occurring acid that's in our bellies that allow the fat to be broken down. There are companies that have made this into an actual injection. The brand name is Kybella. And with this Kybella, you basically plant these injections into the area that's most full underneath the, the mandible or the jaw into this double chin area. It usually requires numerous injections. It's done many months apart, these injections, and it can cause quite a bit of swelling and it can be painful because it is an acid that you're injecting into the neck area and it can be difficult to control exactly which pockets of fat get dissolved since it's just a chemical that's dispersing and the cost of the procedure does quickly add up and again we're going to cover costs at the end of this talk so you'll get a sense of how much something like this runs. Next you have cool sculpting. Cool sculpting is a way of freezing fat cells Fat cells in general are more responsive to freezing than some other cells in our body, and the cool sculpting method takes advantage of that, and it can cause uh, an apoptosis or a death to the fat cells, reducing the fat in different parts of the body, including the submental or the double chin area. There is a risk of what's called paradoxical adipose hyperplasia, which is actually a thickening or a growth of fat cells instead of a shrinkage and a death of the fat cells. And some people actually have extra fullness 
after that, which is a risk of the cool sculpting method. And of course, there is weight loss, which can impact on the subcutaneous fat and people do see a reduction as they lose weight. Next, you have surgical options for excess subcutaneous fat. And the most common method is submental liposuction. And that's using different types of cannulas with a small little incision underneath here. And sometimes I like to do a lateral port as well with just a little tiny needle poke as opposed to an incision just to kind of get a more lateral approach. And basically you're gliding in that plane underneath the skin in that subcutaneous layer and you're reducing the amount of fat, literally sucking it out, either doing it manually with the, just a syringe and a hand motion or using a um, suction type of machine that allows for the removal of that fat. There are, of course, different safety considerations. You have to make sure everything is done sterilely to reduce the risk of infection. And there's always risk of marginal mandibular nerve injury, which the nerve runs around here, uh, close to the facial notch. And if you're not careful with the plane that you're in, when you're doing the liposuction, you could potentially injure that nerve. So as with everything surgical and non-surgical, you have to go to a well-trained, licensed professional who knows what they're doing with any of these procedures. So those are the ways to address the subcutaneous fat. And it's important to point out here that you don't want to over harvest and over deplete that subcutaneous fat. Think of the subcutaneous fat as like a cushion. It's a cushion between the skin and that platysma muscle. The platysma muscle will continue to age and show those signs of aging such as banding. And what you don't want to do is deplete the subcutaneous tissue so much that now any of those changes to the underlying muscle will start to show at the skin surface. Also, if you're too aggressive with the uh, submental liposuction, you can get uh, dimpling and ridging along the neck and you can get skin irregularities. So whenever I'm doing submental liposuction, I use what's called a flap cannula and we'll flash that here, where only one side of the cannula has a port for harvesting fat. The other side is nice and smooth. So the side that's running along the undersurface of the skin is your smooth side. And that way you can't injure that dermis, which is the layer just deep to the epidermis, which is what you're seeing, and you help protect the quality of the overlying skin, which is really important. If you reduce that subcutaneous fat too much, you can then potentially uh, show more of the platysmal aging process, and your skin might not look as healthy. So be very careful with uh, aggressive approaches to the area. The next topic to discuss is platysmal banding. So we'll go over the non-surgical modalities that can help with platysmal banding. And the main one is neurotoxin. Most people know it as Botox. Botox can temporarily paralyze the muscle. As we know, platysma is muscle. And when you get a, like a hyperactivity of that muscle, you can stun it with the neurotoxin, with Botox, and that can help soften those bands. Now you must be careful here for people getting these types of injections to not get over injected with Botox because there have been situations where people have had some difficulty with their breathing or swallowing after these types of injections into the platysmal bands. So one must be careful with Botox. And as you know, Botox is temporary. Every three to four months, you need to get these injections repeated, but it can help for platysmal banding. Now, as far as platysmal banding on the surgical front, the main way to address this is with what is called a platysmoplasty, and that addresses the muscle dehiscence. Sometimes that muscle can separate and start to form these bands, and what you're doing with surgery is basically reconnecting the muscle down the middle, reducing any redundancy that exists in the muscle or laxity, and tightening up that muscle, and that suturing is done right down the middle, and that can really help strengthen and improve the band of the platysma muscle. It's often combined with a facelift and neck lift. When we're doing that type of surgery and if we have incisions out laterally, we'll add an incision in the submental area 
to allow access to the platysma and to do a platysmoplasty. There is a way to do it only through a direct approach through just the submental incision. And sometimes that's being done as a platysmoplasty combined with deep neck surgery. So we'll get into that shortly. Please make sure if you're learning something new to like the video. We do these for you guys. It's supposed to be educational. We hope you're learning from it and we would really appreciate a like on the video. Thank you so much. Now let's get into excess subplatysmal fat. So right, we have the superficial fat that's subcutaneous, then we have the platysma, now we have the subplatysma, and so some people have excess fat there. Non-surgical ways to approach this is, well, there are none. That's the honest truth. And so oftentimes, this extra fat that we have that's deep is congenital, meaning we're just born with it. So even younger patients can have a quite full neck, even patients who really are skinny and they don't have a lot of weight overall, but their neck can appear full and they can have a very obtuse angle as opposed to an acute angle. And that could be because of this deep neck fat that they were just born with. And oftentimes the weight loss or, or weight changes don't impact on that deep fat very much. It can, it can increase as we gain weight or as we uh, get older, but oftentimes it's more resistant to change compared to the subcutaneous fat, which is very interesting. We also have surgical ways of approaching this excess subplatysmal fat. The main way to do this is through deep neck surgery. So this is done through a submental approach and what is done here is you go into the area and we actually have a video we're going to be playing as we talk about this you guys can get a better sense of exactly how this is done but through this incision underneath the chin and this double double chin area you can go in there and define your plane find your platysma separate the platysma down the middle and now you can get under the platysma and this of course requires an advanced understanding of anatomy and you know you have to go to someone who really knows what they're doing and you go underneath the platysma which has a lot of blood vessels so one must be very careful when operating in this space and that's very important here and you go in there and you remove the deep fat as you do that you now have more of a deficit here and so the extra skin that now you have that's hanging here is going to redrape into that deficit to fill that void because a lot of people ask well if you remove the deep stuff isn't the skin just going to hang no because the skin has to fill the void and so it actually does redrape quite nicely and you get a better definition to your neck now this isn't always the first line treatment for patients but it can really redefine your neck in a way that some people have never even had before. Some people are born, like I said, with a neck that isn't to their liking. It doesn't have the shape that they see on other people that they find, you know, maybe more attractive. So the only way to assure that you can recreate that is through deep neck surgery, which has, you know, of course, risks and, and downsides, but it is an important modality that we use for the, the right candidate. In addition to the deep neck fat, there's also sometimes hypertrophy or an enlarged size to the digastric muscles. So that's the anterior digastric muscles. They can be hypertrophied, sometimes only on one side of the muscle, and we can shave that down while we're in that space working on the deep neck. That can be addressed at the same time. Now, this again is done often when the superficial approach like the subnano liposuction or the Kybella or the cool sculpting fails and people are still unhappy with the way that they see their neck. And that's why we do this type of deep neck approach. It can be done as an individual approach with just this incision for a younger patient where skin laxity is not the main problem or on an older patient where you have also extra skin and you need to take that slack out of the system. We do lateral approaches, lateral incisions with the facelift and combine it then with the deep neck approach. So sometimes it's only the incision under the chin, other times it's the lateral incisions around the ears and the incision under the chin. That's an important point. Now, let's get into submandibular gland hypertrophy or hyperplasia and non-surgical ways to address that. 
The most common way would be with Botox or neurotoxin. That can reduce the actual flow of the salivary fluid out of the submandibular glands, but it can also reduce the size of the gland itself. Not the most common treatment that's done, but there are some places that will do cosmetic type of aesthetic enhancements with Botox into those glands. But because of the location of the glands and difficulty to get there, it's often helpful to use like an ultrasound machine. That's not the most common type of aesthetic procedure, but something that could help. And then of course there are surgical options for submandibular gland hypertrophy. And that includes partial or complete submandibular gland excision. And that's usually done through this incision as we've already talked about, the submental incision. And with deep neck surgery, you can get in there and re at least partially remove a portion of the submandibular gland that's underneath the level of the mandible or the this jawbone that can be causing some fullness in the neck or some people actually go in and remove the glands completely. Some people are against doing that and some people feel that it's appropriate to sometimes consider doing that. Now the risks include bleeding, it includes a nerve injury, there is an important nerve, the marginal mandibular nerve that runs through that, through that area. In experienced hands we know how to avoid that. The nerve runs laterally on the gland, so if you're on the medial or the more central component of the gland it's a fairly safe area to work, especially if you're within the capsule of the gland. There is also the risk of a sialocele or a salivary fistula that can happen if you're cutting into the gland, the saliva of fluid, the, it can flow, it can continue to flow after surgery. So drains are very important for situations like that, so you don't get accumulation of fluid in the neck and then get a potential infection. And another approach to improving the submandibular gland ptosis or just the hanging of the gland that can occur over time is to strengthen the platysma muscle. The platysma muscle lives on the outer surface of the gland. It lives more superficially and you can, by tightening up the platysma muscle, you can secure the gland at least temporarily in a more lifted position. So that usually is done through a lateral lifting approach of the platysma, which is common during facelift and neck lifting, and that can also help the positioning of that gland. Now, let's get into chin under projection or chin recession, right? What do we do with a chin that's receded where we can't get that nice acute cervical mental angle? Well, one way to improve that is non-surgical with filler. You can use like say Restylane Lift to improve the fullness and the projection of the chin. If you wanted to go down the route of a surgical approach, you would do something like a chin implant with say silicone or uh, like a MedPore type of product to add fullness to the chin, give that projection so that you can recreate that angle. Or there's also a genioplasty surgery where a portion of the bone is cut, moved forward, resecured with usually some plates and screws, and that can also help. So what do these procedures cost? First, we have Kybella. Kybella runs about $1,000 to $2,500 per treatment, and you often need four to six treatments over the course of many months to really see the improvement in the submental area or in the double chin area. Then you have cool sculpting. That type of treatment can run you from $750 to $1,000, and usually you need two to three of those treatments to see improvement. Next type of treatment would be the submental liposuction. Again, depends who you go to, but that can run you from $3,000 to $5,000 plus, depending on if you're getting it done under local anesthesia, which is the way I usually do it, or if you're gonna go to sleep and have sedation for that type of treatment. Then we have chin implant surgery. That can run from $5,000 to $10,000 and up to get a chin implant placed. And again, depends if you're going to be awake or asleep for that type of treatment. Lastly, we have a deep neck lift. And that can be combined sometimes with a facelift or it can just be done directly for the deep neck as we talked about earlier in this video. And that can run usually from $10,000 to $25,000 and up because that almost always requires at least IV sedation to keep people comfortable 
for that type of surgery. And if you've enjoyed this video, please make sure to check out our video on facelifting. We did a facelift type of video with a, a model where we show all the different types of facelifts on this uh, special type of plaster head. And we think that it's very educational and beneficial to everybody who's interested in that type of procedure. And whoever wants to learn more can check that out. Click on the card and I'll see you there.